Barnaby Jones will return next Thursday night at 10, 9 Central and Mountain on most of these stations. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Welcome back, everybody. Time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. I don't even know John Jackson Miller, but the fact that he reacted positively to the Barnaby Jones special interruption shows that uh, we're going to have a great conversation. It's nice to meet you, John. Uh, you too. And uh, I, I have to say, I uh, was just tweeting the other day because people were discussing their love for the old CBS special uh whirling intro and because it's one of the useless things that i happen to know i was like well you know that 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 music is actually part of call to danger which is a pilot that the they did for peter graves in uh, i think 66. wow and, oh that's great john i never knew that that's excellent and and what they did was they put it uh on the hawaii 50 soundtrack and so that's why everybody thinks it's a hawaii 50 song but uh, not that everybody thinks that. The nine people who think that they know what it is. <laughs> but... I, I know you're. I know you're Midwest. Um, the uh, the CBS affiliate here in Chicago would run a late night movie uh, uh, soundtrack or theme, yeah. and it was the music from the movie The Stuntman. Oh yeah, and oh. that kind of dynamic music when uh, everybody's shooting at uh, Steve Railsback. You know, that the, the one part of my uh, hobby life that I have not cannibalized for work, because, uh, you know, comics are my job and, you know, everything else, uh, is is my love for classic television. And uh, I have over a thousand TV guides. Uh, I'm being treated for it. I mean, it's, I, <laughs> I, it's not normal. I, I dig it. Uh, but, you know, literally I go through uh, you know, page by page and look at the listings uh, because there's stuff in there that you're not going to find anywhere else. I mean, I stumbled across um, the uh, the pilot that uh, Pam Dauber did in 1977 for uh, she was playing a nun. Uh, and again, the pilot didn't get picked up. And what they did in those days is they would burn off the pilots by showing them, you know, in comedy theater or something like that. Uh, yeah, I could tell you recognize what I'm talking about. You know, usually in the dead of summer when nobody cared. Yep. Uh, and and this particular one is interesting because that's how Gary Marshall found her. He saw her wandering around on the lot wearing a habit and and said, "Okay, uh, she's she's my Mindy." And <laughs> I don't know how exactly he came up with that idea, but you know that's why she was on the lot for this TV show that you know, aired once. You know, it, it, you know, and uh, and uh, never again. So again, yeah, I, I I appreciate that you like all this stuff. I know it's not what we're here to talk about, but it is one of the things that I do. Tangents are welcome, and <laughs> uh, certainly in as far as classic television. And yeah, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure you're the same way. You know, you go down YouTube rabbit holes. Oh yeah. And oh look, it's a 1968 Bob Hope special. Oh. And geez. and that's and literally that's the first time I found one, and oh. it was Ironside will not be seen tonight. 
No. And he had just that stupid like slide of a Raymond Burr head and the word Ironside. And I'm like, oh, I need those for my no, YouTube. No, that's wonderful. I, so I've been, oh, I've got, I've got several. And it, what, you know, only I played Barnaby Jones because it is Thursday night. So and he mentions Thursday night. I'll tell you when, when we get to the end after the important business, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the thing that I did for uh, for Planet of the Apes that uh, feeded uh, uh, Carol Burnett. So <laughs> that's that's a, a, a book that I did for Planet of the Apes. So we'll talk about talk about that. That would be my end. pleasure. Well, yeah, man, because honestly, like I said, I, I and in the title, I've got Star Trek, I've got Star Wars, I've got yeah. comics. But no, I know that you've done a lot of uh, book adaptations of yeah. licensed stuff. Um, you know, John, I, I love, and I always say this when I have somebody like yourself or Michael Jan Friedman or Max yeah. Allen's. Uh, I love at Comic Con when you when you guys have those panels yeah. and you do awards for uh, <laughs> the best adapted uh, the books. Yeah. And you know Marv Wolfman as well as I has had it wrote it written his share Peter David yeah. so no it's I, I always love talking to guys like yourself and yeah you know I I, I know I asked Mike uh, to uh, you know at least like warm warm you know <laughs> test the waters in terms of hey would John come on to, to talk because I'd love to talk about his about his novels so I'm really glad you're here well and, and uh, I'm glad you had him reach out because I had not I had not talked to uh, Michael Jan Friedman since. Uh, I did. I did a trilogy uh, of. Uh, I, I did a trilogy uh, of Star Trek novels for the 50th anniversary, uh, and one of them called back frequently on uh, a book that's actually behind me. Yeah, there, there we go. Uh, the the Kalis novel that uh, that Michael wrote. Yeah, there it is, right behind my thumb. Uh, in hard. Oh, cover. yeah. And so the stuff that I the stuff that I refer to frequently, I keep you know right right so I can swivel and grab. Sure. Uh, and uh, and yeah, he I I, you know, I I acknowledged him in the book, and I just never got around to letting him know about it. So oh, that's great. So uh, so yeah, I mean every everything that everybody in the tie-in realm does is built on years and years and years going back. Um, and and you know, uh, Alan Dean Foster is is sort of the you know, the patron saint of what we do, and uh, and then of course. But it goes so much farther back. Um, you know, I think in my research, I would say that the first real licensed tie-in uh, novel would have been Lone Ranger, uh, which would have been uh, tied into the radio show. Sure. And uh, and uh, Fran Stryker, who uh, created the Lone Ranger, also wrote the books. So, you know, that's it, it's as canonical, I guess, if you care about canon. <laughs> and of course, and, and the, whole, the whole association with canon and these sorts of things anyway goes to the Sherlock Holmes guys even before that. Uh, but, uh, but again, you know, these kinds of books have always just been uh, for many, many years, they were just uh, one more licensed product. They were one more, you know, thing that you would uh, you know, advertise in the, on, you know, with, with the, uh, you know, a toy in the cereal box or something like that. It would be just another revenue stream. And, so um, it would be completely normal for uh, a, a tie-in novel uh, to come out where the people involved with the television show had no idea what was in it or anything. Um, and, and this is why, uh, you know, you, you, you've got uh, from, from Golden Books, uh, uh, you know, Western Publishing, you know, you've got all those hardcover novels for uh, Beverly Hillbillies and I Love Lucy and things like that coming out. Uh, and you know, there's there's no real relationship to the shows. You know, it's very clear that nobody with the shows had anything to do with them. There's no quality <laughs> control. Um, and you know what happens is this changes uh, really because of the dual efforts of uh, you know, I, and of course this is why I'm here. Star Trek: Strange New Worlds, the high oh, yeah. the new novel, um, and also uh, Star Trek, and also Star Wars. Uh, Gene, Gene Roddenberry and and George Lucas and you know, Roddenberry basically cares uh, about what is coming out in his name or in his show's name. Um, and to the point where, you know, after the first uh, well, Golden Press uh, book, uh, uh, Mission to Horatius comes out, or actually it hasn't come out yet. Uh, he's alerted by uh, one of his writers that this book has severe problems. Uh, it, it does not you know, it does, it, it, you know, it, it has, uh, you know, 
Sulu and Uhura are treated in ways that they would never be treated on the show. Um, and there's just other issues with this book. And uh, he gets in there and he gets them to stop publication and revise the book. Wow. Uh, and at the same time, we've got uh, also at, 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 you know, at Western uh, Publishing, which is Racine, Wisconsin, which is, you know, I, I'm in Wisconsin, so it's yes. kind of other end of the state for me. But um, but they also have the uh, the Gold Key Star Trek comic. And the early uh, issues of uh, the Gold Key comic were uh, drawn by a, a, a nice artist, but he was in Italy and he had never seen the show. Uh, and so you've got uh, panels where flames are coming out of the back of the nacelles. Uh, <laughs> and, and so you know, there's, a, there's obviously a quality control thing going on here. And uh, one of the things that, um, uh, that uh, Roddenberry puts in a letter to Paramount uh, at the time is that, you know, they should actually um, make an office of, uh, you know, tie in uh, credibility or is <laughs> to just check yeah. things out, um, continuity, and, you know, like continuity control, or continuity whatever. control. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, uh, and he actually recommended uh, DC Fontana for that. Uh, and uh, what ends up happening is they don't go anywhere with that. But it ends up being uh, that, you know, when that happens, it happens from Star Wars. Uh, and uh, that that person is, uh, you know, the first person to really kind of uh, uh, have it in their job title, uh, Leland Chi, the keeper of the Holocron, uh, which is literally his job title. And he is basically the continuity wrangler for years. Um, that's not to say that there weren't people managing things in the inter interim years, uh, you know, Richard Arnold was, uh, you know, handling all of these things for Paramount uh, in uh, in uh, the uh, in the 80s and 90s, and 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 Rod Mary, uh, alternately, depending on who was in charge of whatever was going on. But sure. Uh, but but again, you know, what happens, I think, is, um, you know, well, getting getting prematurely getting to Planet of the Apes. Uh, the, well, here's CBS, a CBS special presentation. I believe it's 1973, might be 72, where um, Planet of the Apes and the other, the next two movies are shown in s sequential uh, weekends uh, on on Friday nights. Yes, and that is when um, really lunchbox television explodes uh, in terms of you know suddenly uh, you know these films which. Were kind of adult films. Uh, they were they were you know, not not these are not G rated movies, um, but suddenly uh, it's something where you know now we're a lot more able to sell tie in merchandise to it, and um, you know Marvel gets the uh, the you know, the Planet of the Apes uh, comics license. Uh, people start um, you know doing a lot more of this stuff. They start caring a lot more about the merchandise. Star Trek had some merchandise, but a lot of it was kind of random, you know, the uh, the uh, you know, the the helmet and everything. Um, the and, toys but, that the toys that made us the Netflix show exactly, that Brian exactly. Weiss made uh, but, does a great ex exploration of that stuff. Please continue though. Yeah, but the uh, the uh, the uh, yeah the uh, when the fans start getting involved, I mean, when you start getting um, well, the blueprints, uh, which uh, yes, the technical manual, the technical the manual, that stuff, yeah, that's that's fan generated and then gets published and then becomes a New York Times bestseller. I mean, the <laughs> the, the, the 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 blueprints, which are not a book, were a New okay. York Times bestselling book, uh, and. And uh, it, you know the, the the what I think is the crazy thing about that is it is Judy Lynn Del Rey who managed that book or managed that product, and the success of that helped the Del Rays start the Del Rey imprint. Wow! The Del Rays uh, the Del Rays assistant uh, was Shelley Shapiro. Shelley Shapiro hired me to write for Star Wars novels years later. So um, everything just sort of connects together and everything, but uh, but but uh, but yeah, I mean it was it was because suddenly licensing looks like it's worth something. Lucas makes his deal saying, "Hey, I tell you what, let me have in my deal with uh, with uh, with Fox. Let me have the licensing rights. Let me have everything. Let me have merchandise." 
And back in the day, nobody cared. It's like, oh, what's 12 cents? Nobody's going to worry about Absolutely, yes. Nobody's going to worry about that. And so what ends up happening? Everything. Everything that comes from it. And, uh, and again, it is kind of a work in progress where, you know, the Marvel comics are there. Uh, the, you know, the novel is, is, is out. Um, but, you know, early on, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the licensor decides or, you know, Lucasfilm decides, yeah, we, we can't just do anything in these comics. We've got to have kind of quality control on them. And this results in, um, you know, Roy Thomas, who was going to leave the book anyway, leaving the book. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, sort of, we have the beginnings of, uh, you know, not exactly a story Bible that people are working with or, or regulations that people are working with, but there's a lot more oversight. And so things start evolving. And, and, and then what happens is we get this sort of organic thing where all the guys who are doing tie up tie-ins and there are women doing tie-ins as well, but the, all the people who are doing tie-in work, um, you know, we're all sort of reading each other's stuff. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, Brian Daly's, uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, B- Brian Daly's uh, novel, uh, the Han Solo novel, ends up winding up in um, uh, Archie Goodwin's comic strip. Um, and they start using, you know, names of planets and things. And things start sort of bouncing back. So by the time yeah. we get to um, when the real Star Wars expanded universe begins... You know, it's we're already at a point where this has kind of been done for a while. Uh, the West End role playing game uh, people uh, have established all this stuff for the Star Wars universe while Star Wars has been sort of hibernating. They send all of those books to uh, to uh, uh, Timothy Zahn when he's writing Heir to the Empire. Yep. And now we're off to the races and we've got, you know, things that are showing up in TV shows that were in those role-playing game books from the eighties. And we've got, you know, um, you know, uh, Sulu's name is coming from the novels. Uh, You know, we've got, we've got things happening like, you know, I, you know, the, uh, there's, there's all sorts of things going on. Like my, my, my novel for the rebels TV series came out a month before the series uh, launched. Um, And, you know, the, the the tie-in books, are now considered to be a much bigger part of what's a media franchise. And again, this has been a long introduction to basically say, this is all great, John. Go on. This is, this is a, 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 this is, this is a, this is all a long way of basically saying, um, you know, we've gone from being uh, an afterthought. Um, you know, I, I, I've, I've, I've got over here a, a, a shelf that you would probably love. Oh, there we go. The dude on. I got a shelf over here that you probably love with the because uh, I, I I collect these media tie-in books. I've got the first Happy Days novel, ha! Uh, the, the first Happy Days novel called Ready to Go Steady. Uh, it features among other things uh, Chuck Cunningham uh, going to the beach on page four and never returning. Uh, Hilarious. <laughs> but, but, but it also features it also features Ron Howard uh, his character uh, Richie. Uh, uh, Richie Cunningham. He gets engaged. Well, no. Nobody- wow. Nobody ever would have pretended that an engagement in the novels, you know, that character is never going to be mentioned on the TV show. They probably didn't even, didn't even know about it. Um, but, you know, then we come along to, uh, uh, you know, the solo movie, and uh, here's Darth Maul showing up, who should be dead. But if you watch the cartoons, you would know he wasn't. And it's because, you know, there there is sort of this intermedia uh, connectivity that's going on, um, you know, characters uh, are, are you know showing up places. Um, you know, I I um, you know was was noticed because I was watching the Kenobi TV show, and I'm I'm um, I you know there's there's an element from uh, from my novel uh, that is that is present in the show, but I was also just watching uh, you know, the uh, the uh, you know the Inquisitor's tower and the layout of it. And it's like I did that in a role playing game ten years ago. <laughs> And so it might have been in somebody's file somewhere and it might have gone here and there and the other one. And this stuff that just didn't, you know, it was all ancillary. And now it's 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 the show. I mean, obviously, you know, we're 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 the we're the tail. We're not the dog. We don't I would never I would never expect somebody to change a movie because 
you know, the the one tenth of one percent of the viewers of that would have read my book or read a comic book that would conflict with it. That's sure. not the way it's supposed to work. I, I mean, it's yeah, but uh, but but at the same time, uh, you know, there is this sort of thing where it's like uh, you'd like to you'd like to see a, a, a clip at the end of the movie, and apparently DC has done this with uh with one of the with one of the movies where they they have a thing at the end oh yeah shazam um supposedly it's uh, they put a clip at the end of a shazam movie showing the graphic novels uh oh, and wow. I, I may be misremembering that but i saw i saw heidi mcdonald post something about that a couple of days ago uh and, and, and yeah because it was on comicsbeat.com and and yeah i mean you know speaking of you know, old television there would always be that that educational program we would watch. And at the end, the actor would come out and say, if you'd like to learn more about uh, you know, uh, the dangers of uh, driving while texting, uh, read this book, this book, and this book. Read more yes. about it. Well, I mean, that's kind of what this is. If you liked the Kenobi TV show, here's another whole book. If you like the, there you go. If you like the Strange New Worlds TV show, you know, here's more. And uh, there you go. You're you're on on the ball with these things. Oh yeah, so, man. No, so no, that's, I can't prepare. <laughs> so you know, it, it, it's it's just such a different um, uh, world, and you know, we have uh, you know more communication with the people at the studios. Um, you know, the Strange New Worlds novel is um, is one where, uh, like the previous three novels that I did for, I did two for Discovery, and I did one for uh, Picard. Uh, yeah. And with all, with all three of them, um, these novels started with a phone call to uh, Kirsten Beyer, who uh, is in the writer's room on Discovery. She uh, is the co-creator of Picard, and she's one of the executive producers on Strange New Worlds. And she is one of us. She uh, wrote the novels for uh, for uh, uh, Star Trek Voyager uh, and still After likes the, the, that continued the uh, exactly. story after it, Endgame, after it, the last... Uh, exactly, and, and and she still writes uh, some of the comics. And one of the things here is that, you know, they basically said, you know, you know she was appointed to kind of be the person in the room to deal with all of the rest of us. Uh, and and with her and, and, and my friend Dayton Ward, who's, who's uh, you know, sort of her go-between on this kind of thing. Uh, the idea is, you know, um, I didn't just go into this book blindly. Um, where it might have been in the past, I might have written something and it might have conflicted with something. You know, 40 years ago, I would have written a novel. It might have conflicted with the show and nobody would have noticed or cared. Um, right. 20 years ago, I might have written something. It might have conflicted with the show and I might have had to have scrapped something entirely or, or, or rewritten everything. Now we're kind of like, you know, every book starts with, okay, here's, here's a good place where you can set a book. Uh, and you're not going to collide with anything. And here's a good kind of thing that, you know, we might not be exploring that you can explore. Um, and here's an opportunity where you can bring a character on screen uh, or on, on page before that person appears on screen. Um, that's great. Yeah. And, and, and again, that's at Star Trek. Star Wars does the same thing with something called the, the Lucasfilm Story Group. Uh, the New Dawn book was the first... Uh, novel uh, first work really done with the Lucasfilm story group. And yeah, I, I got two thirds of the way through that book and they said, we need you to fly out to Lucasfilm because <laughs> we're going to announce that this is the first book in this new era. Of, and and of, Dave, Dave Filoni wrote the forward to the Dave. Book. Dave wrote the forward and see, he had already, I had already been in, you know, he had already been um, reviewing he and the other two executive producers had already been reviewing my outlines and giving me ideas for it. And I did a conference call with Dave and the rest of the story group. I just didn't know that that was what they were going to do. And I didn't know that they were going to declare at that point that um, everything before my book was going to be considered what they call legends. And, uh, you know, the legends thing was, was there was some controversy involved with that because people thought it was a, you know, a hard reboot. Um, or they thought that it was really canonical before when frankly, whatever George said was canon was canon. 
Um, that's 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 uh, yeah, that's that's kind of. In fact, yeah. they, in fact, in, on on Wikipedia, they call it G canon for anything that George either said or came from one of his works. Um, uh, George Lucas. Yeah. Uh, and and you know, it, it, in fact, what it simply was is basically saying, okay, we're going to use all of these past works basically the same way that Tim Zahn used those role-playing books. It's going to, this is the world building that we've already done. We don't need to recreate the galaxy. We don't need to recreate the planets. We don't need to recreate all the elements and the everything else and the corporations. Uh, and in some cases, um, you know, we don't need to recreate the characters. Uh, so we've had Thrawn imported from um, the previous works. Uh, I've had some characters come forward from the previous works. Um, it, it's just really more of a way of, you know, you, you could not give J.J. Um, Abrams a billion dollar movie to direct and, and, and write and say, oh, by the way, uh, you have to read 25 novels, 35 novels, uh, and everybody who watches the film also needs to watch those 25, <laughs> read those 25 novels. That's going to be a really long opening crawl. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a number of the really good story, you know, moments for our characters, uh, you know, their children and, and everything else. These, these things had already been used. These things had already been done. And Chewbacca was dead. And we weren't going to put that in an opening trailer of anything. So uh, opening crawl. So, I mean, it, it's totally understandable why it needed to be done. And um, so, yeah, I, I you know... Did the did the video talked about it and and I'm I'm okay with it. Uh, look, I'm a lifelong comics fan. I know you are. We are more comfortable. I think. In fact, when I saw the reaction to it, the comics fans were fine because the comics fans were like, okay, yeah, you know, ten percent of my comic books are in canon anyway. Um, <laughs> everything I've got has already been rebooted two, three times. Sure. Um, and and you know uh, as I as I put it a lot, um, you know my favorite Batman stories were never official anyway. I mean it was well. I mean uh, Dark Knight Returns was not an official story. It was in a in a thing. Uh, yeah. Gotham by Gaslight. That's an Elseworld before yes. they even had the word Elseworld. I was going to say the first Elseworld, absolutely before that's, Elseworld. You're right. That's exactly that's exactly it. So I mean you know I I we're I think the comics fans are a lot more uh i don't know about nimble but uh we're, we're easier <laughs> we're used to it no you're right man we're, we're totally used to it absolutely the other thing too to, that's important about these adaptations certainly in between um the original runs yeah. and uh where we are now with nerd tv and nerd movies and stuff you guys were the keepers of the flame uh you know uh name your favorite franchise paul cornell yeah writing his Doctor Who novels oh, yeah. uh, during those, I, I love the phrase, the wilderness years. And yeah. it's true where literally it was the adaptations yeah. that kept the flame going between times of, oh, yeah. you know, the BBC suddenly going, Hey, you know, Doctor Who is actually pretty good. Maybe we need to go back to it. Well, and you know, and I, same thing with Star Trek and Star Wars. Sure. You know, I, again, I, I hate to do the kids today thing, uh, but the kids, <laughs> the, the kids, the, the kids today, have never known a time when they couldn't actually see the original movie or original TV show when they wanted to. Yes. On demand. Um, yeah. I had to wait until uh, February 1, 1983 to see Star Wars on TV, uh, even though I had seen it in the theater a lot. Uh, it wasn't available until then uh, on HBO. And so if you wanted to experience the movie again in that whole six year stretch, You've got to go to stories. You've got to go to you know, storybooks. You've got to go to comics. You've got to go to action figures. You've got to go to all this other stuff. Real and good. yeah, and that's and that that that's really you know it keeps the brand alive. And and so yeah, the kind of thing I do, um, you know, I, I I talk about you know having a passport, uh, you know, you to the to the universe. Um, you know, you write in one franchise, it establishes that you know what you're doing. And that you can treat the license, uh, you know, kindly and not ruin things, and that you're not going to have ideas that are going to be really off-brand or uh, or you know detrimental to the collective storytelling. Um, you know, I I, uh, I I used to joke that 
you know, the worst thing you could do is show up and say, hey, I got a great idea for a story. Luke and Leia were twins in the movies, but I'm going to say they're really triplets. And there's a third guy out there and he's, <laughs> you know, well, that's 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 uh, that's a good way to not <laughs> Get a get a get a sale. Um, uh, you know, you, you don't want to do anything that has a a huge footprint. Uh, and when you do get a chance to do something that has a fairly large footprint, then you try to want to do something special. So, and that that so I've got some books that I've written where yeah, they've said you get you get you get a couple of years to play with uh, in the character's storyline or in the character's history. Um, my Rogue Elements novel that I did for for a Star Trek Picard. Uh, yeah, that was two years out of the character's life. Um, and, uh, you know, Strange New Worlds. Was that yeah, the, that's yeah, Rios. Rios. That's the Rios one, yeah. yeah. And then the Strange New Worlds novel. Well, I'm not going to say how much time it takes, but it's a significant amount of time. Um, and my Enterprise War novel, which was my first novel with the Anson Mount, uh, uh, Captain Pike, uh, that, one, uh, that one was a full year. And so I, I tried to make a big sprawling story that was worthy of, you know, taking up a year of their uh, a, a year of their lives. Now, there you go. You're you're on you're on target. <laughs> that's that's great. So so anyway, yeah, that's that's kind of the thing. Is um is yeah yeah. If you're doing this sort of thing, your job is to put all the toys back in the toy box when you're done, um and uh to you know leave the universe in its upright and locked position and don't don't cause a lot of problems for the next writer. And, um, and that's why, you know, I was able to go from Marvel to star Wars uh, to all the video game franchises. I've done some stuff with and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, I, you know, this stuff that's pure fun, the Simpsons I did. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, the, I think the trifecta for me, the, uh, the, the, the sort of, 12, the trifecta for 12-year-old me, I think, was 2018 because I had a new Star Wars story out, a, a new Star Trek novel and uh, in production, and I wrote the 40th anniversary graphic novel for Battlestar Galactica. Oh, that's uh, great, man. Yeah, that was that was for a company called Dynamite. And Sure. Uh, oh, I, I and, know. Nick Ferrucci's company. Sure. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and, you know, that's not something that you do because it's going to you know, be a bestseller or, or, um, you know, bring in loads and loads of cash. Uh, you do it because you just love the idea of doing it. And I, uh, I, I enjoyed that so much. I will say the thing that was eye opening for me was realizing after I, I, I started working on it, that I was the only person working on that comic book that was alive when the show was on. <laughs> and so I ended up having, I ended up having to uh, kind of play uh, unofficial assistant editor. Uh, Cause I would, I would look at things. Oh. And I'd say, okay. I would say, okay, now that is, that is from the new Battlestar Galactica, not the old Battlestar Galactica. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, that is, that's uh, that's the wrong kind of Cylon. There is the wrong kind of whatever, and we would fix it. And uh, you know, again, everything. Uh, you know, th th they were wonderful about it. We got everything you know fixed. So that's awesome. So was your so was your uh, Dynamite Battlestar run? Was that in the nineteen seventy eight continuity? Was it Lauren yes. Green Battlestar? Yes. Oh, yes. I wrote great. it as if I wrote it as if the show never ended, and as if they had all the money in the world. Sure. Uh, and so I have lots of aliens. I have lots of different uh, spaceships. Um, you know, the uh, the book is called Counter Strike. Uh, it actually got me uh, one of these uh, oh, things that's back here. The uh, that was the the Dragon Award uh, that year. Oh, hey! And uh, yeah, you know, zoom in. That's great. And, yeah, so that's uh, that's a big glass thing back there. I can't. That's imagine. excellent, man. Well, they didn't. They, they it wasn't. What amazed me was not just that they got that to me through the mail because it was during COVID. Uh, but they also got it to my artist, uh, Daniel HDR, who's in uh, uh, Brazil, and oh, that's uh, great. they managed to get it to him safely, and that was that was amazing. Absolutely, um, man. Oh, that's but uh, great. but yeah, with that that book, I love doing that book. It was uh, the idea was uh, the uh, Galactica, which is on the run from the Cylons. They encounter another fleet of refugees that's on on the run from another group of tormentors. And I got to do a thing where, you know, first it's let's team up 
and then it's like you know, then 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 there's sort of this realization that oh it's actually the uh, the the people that are chasing them that are in the right uh and then we have to sort of solve the whole thing sure uh, but uh but that was that was fun and it was educational for me as well because i got to you know, wallow in all the stuff from the original series way back when when uh when richard hatch and i want to say christopher golden were yes. doing those uh, continuation yes uh battlestar novels of the yeah. 78 show I was all over that stuff. Yeah, I uh, I interviewed uh, Richard for uh, for that uh, when it came out in uh, in uh, uh, Comics Buyer's Guide. We did it. We did a special That's issue. Great. That, yeah, that was that because and we were able to tie it in because that was when Realm Press uh, was uh, doing the uh, the Galactica books. Very briefly, I did write. Uh, you know, before I actually got published, uh, uh, you know, in in professionally in comics. Uh, which was 2003. That was a book called Crimson Dynamo at Marvel. Uh, I had I had written and sent in to Realm a Battlestar Galactica story with uh, with Shiva. That was the Anna Lockhart character. And again, you know, it just went the way of all things that go to companies that don't exist uh, anymore. But uh, but again, it's not like I, I my heart wasn't in in that place to begin with. So that's great, man. Hey, I want to acknowledge a couple comments that we got. And uh, that is uh, from Dan. Uh, the Knights of the Old Republic run was fantastic. Zane and his crew were awesome. I wish we got more of that Sith family from Knight Errant. And yes. uh, and Joe says, couldn't agree more. Uh, the comics of those were amazing. I think I've got a Knight Errant cover. Yeah. Uh, grab it. Knight Errant is actually being reprinted in March uh, in but from Marvel. The uh, all I did three graphic novels for that. And it's been reprinted by Marvel. Yeah, that's the novel. Uh, and I did three uh, graphic novels concurrently, or three comic series that got graphic novelized. And those are all coming up in um, uh, Star Wars Epic Collection Volume 5 for the Old Republic. And that is, I think, the 7th of May. And then, of course, there's the gar gargantuan 1,344-page, uh, you know, yeah, there we go, the, the gigantic uh, Knights of the Old Republic uh, 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 you know, omnibus. Yeah. Uh, the first omnibus has the entire Knights of the Old Republic run, all fifty-seven issues, and then volume two, which I'm assuming is going to come out in 2025. Uh, that is going to come. That that is what that's going to have is um, it'll have all of my Lost Tribe of the Sith comics, which are in the fourth volume of the Epic Collection, and it'll have all of the Knight Errant comics, which are in volume five. And then there's there's the miscellaneous other series that fell continuity wise in between the two, but people will be able to buy these two doorstops of a book, yeah. and and have you know my you know more or less my complete Star Wars at Dark Horse, with the exception of just like one issue that was my my uh, my my uh, audition issue. <laughs> okay, very cool. Uh, Dave has a question. He wants to know: Do you have a newer Star Wars character that you're dying to write? And he loves your Rebels novel. Uh, yeah, newer Star Wars character. You know, there's uh, I I did a I did a I did a book called uh, Canto Bite uh, in the new era uh, where it was it tied into Episode Eight. Uh, and you know, we one of the problems with that is not problems, but uh, it was about the setting, and it was about the setting before all the characters from. Uh, the, the casino world in episode eight. It yes. was, and it was about the setting. Uh, it was one night, various characters in the background, uh, but it was before the main characters of the movie got there. <laughs> so it's, it would be fun to, it would be fun to actually, uh, you know, show those characters there. It would be fun to show what Lando Calrissian thinks of the place. Sure. Uh, you know, Lando, I've always said would be, you know, he, he's one of the, one of the characters I really, really wanted to write that never got a chance to. But that's okay because I have a character called Griff, who is this sort of a, a grifter character that is in uh, that is in Knights of the Old Republic, uh, that kind of kind of you know scratches that itch to a degree. Very but, cool. But, but Lando is a better dresser. <laughs> and is much taller. Treyway says, "I know he's meant to warn the Republic of Darth Raven's uh, rival, inspiring the creation of Carrick Station in Star Wars. Uh, what 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 is that anagram there?" Uh, Star Wars: The Old Republic. That oh, is the, the online Republic. role-playing game. Did Zane okay. Carrick live to see the event okay. of Knights of the Old Republic in okay. one and two? In your mind, 
Okay, there's there's the answer that's in the books, and then there's the answer that, you know, I, I always question whether I should give it or not, because you never know when they're going to come back and say, hey, uh, come finish, you know, the, you know write, write the next chapter or something like that. And so you want to keep the powder dry and you want to keep the story points uh, uh, clear. Um, you know, it is it is never been established whether uh, Carrick Station in the video game, which is about 100 or so years later, uh, whether it is named for our Zane Carrick. Uh, Zane has three, uh, Zane has four sisters. Uh, there might be other people named Carrick. The name itself is my college dorm from the University of Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and there's a photo of me from last year when I went to Knoxville and I, I held up the book in front of the, the sign because they're going to demolish the, uh, the uh, they're going to demolish the uh, building finally. I was not able to get them to put it on the National Registry just because of my connection. Uh, so, so it's not necessarily the case that Carrick Station means Zane survived or did anything else. The other thing was that at least as far as people know, at the end of that series, Zane hasn't really done anything heroic. Uh, enough to merit that, um, you know, he, he, so, so you have that going on, but then we also have the, um, the Kenobi novel, which does talk about Zane. Uh, it's clear that Obi-Wan Kenobi knows who he was. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's an aside in there, uh, but it is, it is very clear also from, uh, another thing that is in, um, uh, I, I, have to, I have to get this straight. Uh, the, uh, the, the, there's, there's another hint about the future uh, that comes from the fact uh, that uh, the captain of the ship that, uh, that Zane is on at the end of the Knights of the Old Republic series, Captain Morvis. Morvis is also known in the far future, and uh, he's actually an admiral. Uh, at the point at which uh, a message arrives to uh, the galaxy, the Jedi of the galaxy, uh, warning them to uh, flee any uh, of Revan's people if they ever see them. Uh, and that warning appears in uh, the sixth story that is in the Lost Tribe of the Sith book. So anyway, I did a tweet a couple of a couple of months back where I I I, I put all these these threads together, uh, saying okay, here's what is in the text, which kind of tells you because I wrote a number of stories that took place far in the future, and you know it wasn't just for fun. I kind of knew where the characters would end up. It is very much implied that um, Morvis and Zane Im implied are the ones who warn the good people of the galaxy and the Jedi, uh, uh, bad Jedi alert. Uh, and, you know, as for what I think happened to him after that, I, I, I know what I was going to write uh, if we got that far. And I'm going to keep that under my hat because you just never know. Yeah. Yeah. No. Do they, um, is everything moving forward uh, in Star Wars tied to continuity or is there room uh, well, for well, new all legends? Okay, it's all it's all been tied to continuity with some exceptions. Um, they did uh, Star Wars issue one hundred and eight, uh, which is a uh, you know the, the final issue of the Marvel series was one, number one hundred and seven, and you know it's the lowest circulation issue of the series. We haven't even gotten into comic circulation yet, uh, but but it's the lowest circulation issue of the series, <laughs> and it's one of the most dear issues, hard to find. Uh, and what they did was they did a story there where they pretended that the comic was written, you know, in the 80s. And sure, just like when uh, Jim Lee and Claremont continued yeah. their early 90s X-Men. So stuff. there's there's yeah. absolutely room for that. Uh, there's absolutely room for that. And it's simply a matter of, oh, look, I understood uh, Stan and understood why they didn't want to do it before, because it, you get brand confusion. Sure. Um, you're trying to make sure that everybody is on board with the stories that are being told going forward. Absolutely. Um, you're also in a position there in, uh, you know, in 2014, when, when that change happened, you know, Disney had just taken over, uh, you know, the business two years earlier. Um, so, you know, there's a real, it, it's going to take a while, you know, it takes companies a long time just to be able to manage the main product. 
uh, without, uh, you know, throwing in, okay, we're also going to, to market, uh, you know, this variety and this variety and this variety and this variety, uh, these sideline things. Yeah. Um, that takes a lot of staffers, a lot of people, a lot of, um, uh, you know, a loss, uh, also a lot of, uh, you know, there's only so many books that you can put out into the market. I Certainly. mean, we, we know that from, well, every publishing thing we've ever been involved with. So, you know, in, in, in a sense, you kind of have to decide. But, I mean, look at what has happened. I mean, the, the Kenobi novel is back in the Essential Legends collection. Uh, and that's a, that's a new printing of it with a different cover. Uh, but I'm happy with the cover, which is good, because uh, really? I have to live with it. Uh, the, the, okay. the, the, new, the, new, the new cover that we've got for it. Um, and what they're doing is they're basically slowly putting all of the past things that were reprinted in mass market paperback, which really is a, a you know, it almost, it's a near dead format, um, it, it, it are being replaced with trade paperbacks. And uh, I saw from the look on your face, the, the, the near dead format, that's a, that's another whole book selling thing, but yeah, it is, it is, you know, the, the, yeah, the mass market paperback pretty much it's, it's era ended with Walden books. And Interesting. okay. Yeah. Well, because who's selling books now? It's, it's these big showrooms where, uh, you don't have to worry about cramped, uh, you know, shelving right. units. Those mass market paperbacks were designed for sale in newsstands. They were designed right. for sale on spinner racks at, uh, at, 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 you know, at, at well, 7-Eleven. Yes, Places that don't yep. have those books anymore. And so, and, and, you know, uh, mall stores, mall stores like, uh, uh, like, uh, like Walden books, like Walden, Crocs and Britannos. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How many things can we cram into this tiny space? Certainly. Um, they don't make money, um, for anybody. <laughs> that's why, that's why, uh, yeah, because they, because they're returnable, they have to build into the price, all the copies that they're going to destroy, um, because they don't sell, uh, the, the, they, they, um, it, go to Amazon right now, and I bet you, and again, I'm, I can't say for sure, if you find a discount at all on a new trade paperback, it won't be higher than 10%. That's because there is no profit margin on them. Wow. Whereas right. a trade paperback, there's there's room built in. And so uh, just like the hardcovers where, you know, this is this is $25 at retail. Right. But uh, but if you if you get it right now from Barnes and Noble, uh, pre-order it, please pre-order it. Uh, we love it when you pre-order it. I think it's 20 right now in the United States on Barnes and Noble. Um, well, there's room in the price of a hardcover for the retailer to actually make that decision. There's room in the price of a trade paperback for the retailer to make that decision. There is no margin for error in uh, the, the mass market paperback. And so... Uh, they are still coming out, um, but they tend to be well. Um, the uh, as I said, the Star Wars is slowly replacing all of their older mass market paperbacks with trade paperbacks, and the books that did not have audiobooks are getting them. Uh, oh, wow. And so that's yes, that's been happening. Uh, and Star Trek, uh, you know, I I think I think everybody involved would love to do it uh, in terms of the other authors. We'd love to see it happen. Yeah. Um, they are still putting out the, the, the paperbacks. Uh, they tend to be, you know, done in much shorter runs uh, and um, on the on the older stuff. Um, but, you know, I, the fact that that stuff is still coming out means that the publishers still care about it. And the publishers are not letting it die on the vine, not letting people forget about it. These are good stories here. There are good yeah. ideas in them. There are ideas coming from those stories that are showing up in the TV shows. Um Marvel is making billions of dollars by mining its history. Um, you know, I've I've got a I've got a I've got a character in uh, in uh, in Iron Man one and two. I've got a character in uh, Ant Man the Wasp. Uh, you know, and these are from comics that uh, you know came out years ago and haven't even been reprinted. <laughs> but but they're part of the they're part of the thing. They're part of the they're part of the um, you know the collected mass of material. And uh, this, it's all source material. Out, outstanding, John. Honestly, I really uh, no, and and really, I when I talk to authors of of uh, novels and paperbacks and stuff, 
no, this is the kind of information I do want to hear. I'm talking to Brad Meltzer on, on Monday. And I was always asking like, you know, how, how the Kindle is affecting things and the like. So it is yeah. interesting to hear that the mass market paperback is morphing into those collections yeah. that are you know, trade collections that are bigger yeah. and have more stories. Well, let's talk about the new strange new world novel. Yeah. Because obviously it's coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. as, you, as you said, it's your, this is your second Captain Pike era Star Wars uh, or Star Trek novel. That's right. Uh, yeah, yeah, the the uh, the 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 uh, Discovery novel Die Standing is in the same time frame, uh, but Pike is Pike is not in that one. Uh, but yeah, it, yeah, there you go. Uh, that that follows uh, Emperor Georgiou, the uh, the Michelle Yeoh character from the Mirror Universe, uh, and and she knows Pike. Uh, but uh, but uh, no, this is this is the second Pike novel, and yeah, uh, what we did here um, is I uh, I wanted to write a book. Um, yeah, you know, my 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 Rogue Elements book, which was the one with with Rios. Uh, what I did with that was I said I wanted to do something that was completely fun with that novel uh, because we were in the middle of the pandemic, uh, and I threw every fun thing I could find in there. Uh, you know the uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 Iotians, the mobsters from the mob the mobster planet. Yes. Uh, yeah, in a piece of the action, an episode that aired the night that I was born. Uh, <laughs> it, it, absolutely, uh, that very night. Um, yeah, they're in there. Uh, Kivas Fejo, the uh, uh, the the collector. The collector? Yes, yeah. he's in there. Uh, there's a that's lot the guy, of that. that's the guy who captures uh, data, the most toys. Yeah, there, exactly. There's a, there's a there's a uh, there's a lot in that book about book collecting in the 24th century, uh, and what the value of it is. It's a it's a wonderful you know it's a it's a romp. It, it really is. Well, and I did. This is a prequel of Rios. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, it's a, it's a prequel. It's a prequel. It's, well, right, so it's a Picard prequel, but it's it is Picard. after he's out of Starfleet yeah. and yes, in it's, the it's, La Serena or whatever. Yeah, he it's it, he 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 gets the he, he gets the La Serena from the uh the from the mobsters from the Iotians. And that's on the back cover, so that that's not a that's not a spoiler. That's um, great. But they put him into receivership and they they put a they put a they put a an accountant on the bridge with him. And the it, hilarity ensues. Uh, so, that's terrific. So, uh, so, you know, that book was a book where, you know, it was very lighthearted and it went over really well. Um, and, uh, and, you know, then we, you know, by the time, as I said, the summer of, uh, of 2021 comes along, uh, I've just had a heck of a year, uh, uh, in between other various things, uh, my house, uh, the basement wall fell in in a storm. I got, I got an old farmhouse. The basement wall fell in in a storm. So uh, by the time I'm actually writing the outline for this novel, uh, there's a stretch where I'm in a hotel because my 1853 farmhouse has had to be lifted off the ground wow. so that we could so that we could put a new basement underneath. Jeez. And and uh, basement walls underneath. And so I, I thought about the issues of of displacement and being out of out of your element and. You know what? What? What's? What would it be like to? Um, you know, have to have to try to try to figure that out. And I came up with a story where um, the major characters of the series are um, forced to the ground on a single strange new world. Um, the the uh, unlike most of my other books, where there's a lot of space hopping, this is only on one planet. It's just one planet with a lot of different facets and cultures and things going on on it. And uh, I, I also have a situation where, uh, thanks to a science fictional construct that I've come up with, with the, with the help of, with the help of no less than a particle physicist from Fermilab, uh, <laughs> who, who advised me on it, uh, I, I came up with, uh, I came up with something where um, none of the technology works. And so uh, they're out of contact with uh, Enterprise uh, by virtue of, of this particular thing that is, you know, we encounter immediately in the book, uh, the, the problem that they're, they're dealing with. Uh, and it spreads the characters across the planet. Um, and this allowed me to do something that has not been done in a Star Trek novel in over 20 years, um, which is uh, this novel was, was turned in by last April one, we announced it uh, the week after. We announced it the week after that at at uh, Mission Chicago, uh, in in, uh, in in the event that was there. And the very next week, I'm I'm at Star Wars, or not Star Wars. I'm I'm at I'm at uh, I'm at uh, Fan X Indianapolis, 
and I've had the best day because I've just met for the first time. I've, I've just met Loretta Swit, and I've, I've just I've just met uh, Jamie Farr, and I was talking to Jamie Farr about No Time for Sergeants, which was his first movie, and it's, in, and it's a hoot, and he's having it. And I, I I think you've talked to Jamie at some point in the past, I assume, or something. Yes, you know that's funny. Um, we didn't we did a cameo oh, for good. Jamie, and we asked him about his love of comics. And he just went on. I think I saw so, that. I saw that. So great. I saw oh, that. We love well, that. So I was having the best day because I just talked to them, got my photo with both of them. And I find out that because of the, the paper shortage and the supply chain thing, everything is being pushed three months into the future. And so um, that put this book out of being Christmas and being February. Oh, man. And, and so uh, I said, what can we do to make use of this time and also reward the people who have been waiting. And I said, okay, this is a story about journeys. Let's show the maps. Oh, that's I've got, great. <laughs> I've got maps. Uh, it is the first Star Trek novel with maps, I believe, from what I understand, uh, since a book called A Stitch in Time back in 2000. Uh, and the maps are, you know, they're not, they're not the high-tech maps that you see the Enterprise generate. They're the maps from the point of view of the people who live on the planet. Because that's all our cast has to go by. Oh wow! Sure. And um, and they're littered through the book. And one of the cool things is I was I was doing a um, I did a, I do an annual show on Wisconsin Public Radio every Christmas. Um, and what we did this year is we got two of my audiobook readers uh to uh, guest star on and talk about the uh, the thing. So yeah, if you go to if you go to wpr.org, uh, search my name uh and the Route Fifty One show, you'll be able to. Uh, listen to that because it's got Robert Petkoff, who is the audiobook reader of Strange New Worlds, and it's also got um, it's got January Lavoy, who is the audiobook reader for um, uh, not just uh, my uh, uh, Die Standing novel, but she also uh, read some of my Star Star Wars stuff as well. Uh, so uh, it's a great broadcast about what it what's involved in this sort of thing. But at the end of the broadcast, I said because I knew that I knew that uh, I knew that Robert was in the studio. Uh, doing the uh, the novel at the time, and I said, you know, it 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 just kills me that the audiobook readers won't be able to see the uh, the the maps, and they both said, John, they can, um, and the apparently is a thing that they do where uh, you can buy you can have an audiobook which has a PDF extra, and so I talked to the you know folks with the you know, the audiobook side of things, and it looks like they're going to do it. Oh, that's so, great. So yeah, and so the reader will be able to, you know, I don't want the reader to you know, flip through all the maps immediately, although I'm sure everybody's going to. Uh, <laughs> it, it really should be like one of those old film strip bells that says, oh, <laughs> you know, and you know what I'm talking about. I do. <laughs> Did, all right, section three, turn to map three. <laughs> that is fantastic. Dude, that's amazing. So for the broadcast, did you have the two book narrators like play a scene? From uh, they, Worlds, uh, we 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 got clips, audio clips from the actual books. Oh, very and, good. And then and sure. then yeah, they they riffed on on things. And so yeah, I and and I'm I'm now challenged to find a way to put James Mason into uh, a a future Star Trek novel because uh, Petkoff does a great James Mason. Oh, that's great. <laughs> see now, I could see him. I could see a James Mason uh, voice in uh, Galactica is maybe one of the uh, 12 elders, you know. The, oh, Lord, the yes. Silver, well, I mean, you know, you know, you know, was Fred Astaire one? Uh, I mean, he was... Well, well he was I, Starbucks' dad, certainly. Yeah, and Starbucks' dad, believe, that's it, that's it. I, Who, I believe Ray Moland in the... Yes, yeah, so it was Ray Moland. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh no, gosh. hey, John, it's all good, man. You can't, <laughs> we can't bet a thousand and again, we're bad a thousand and again, we're we're talking to the right guys, you and me right now. That was so all good. Oh, that's great. So, oh, my God, that sounds like a great plot. For the high country, which again is only coming out in just a couple of weeks, everybody like under three weeks. Yeah, it's twenty uh, first, and uh, we, we just announced today that is uh, we're doing the um, uh, the book release event is at the Barnes and Noble West Town in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I believe it's the biggest biggest Barnes and Noble in the state. So uh, it is it, it's a it's a it's a great place, and I'm, I'm glad we're able to do that. And then I immediately go from there to uh, Great Lakes Comic Con, and then uh, right after that to Emerald City. And so, and then after that, I've got the Galaxy Con Richmond and so more to you're come. Not, you're not going to come uh, to C2E2 in Chicago? I, 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 if that had been announced, I would be able to tell you. 
So maybe, maybe, maybe we'll get an announcement. That would be good. I would <laughs> yeah, think there, even it's your there, backyard. There's... Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, that, yeah. Uh, look, I, it's, I, I, I rarely am not at C two E two. So that's good. Well, John, yeah, I, I, we gotta. Yeah, but we, I, I can't get ahead of the. I can't get ahead of the uh, the organizers. <laughs> well, I, I, it, I hope you have a table, and I hope to. Uh, I hope uh, to see uh, you there. Uh, definitely. All right, because I'm wandering. I got a couple panels that I'm moderating, but I'm wandering. Oh, very good, uh, very good. But uh, I have to say about Dying Standing, yeah. it's a Giorgio book. It's near yeah. Giorgio, and it's a Section 31 story. I don't know, man. As she continues to succeed in movies, I keep thinking that Section 31 move, uh, TV <laughs> show is either not going to happen or maybe we've got to wait another five years because you know, she's getting very busy. Look, we're in a world where Harrison Ford is in two streaming series. You're right. You're right. So uh, you're I think right, the old are rules right. are gone. Got him. You know, John, I'm so glad you said that because in a, um, I, I taught, in fact, tomorrow night, I'm going to have an episode with uh, my buddies, uh, Franco Aureliani, who's part of Art and Franco, the Tiny Titans guys, and yeah. my friend Mitch Halleck, who runs oh. Terrificon in Connecticut. Yeah. And, yeah. um, and uh, we were talking about before James Gunn made his big announcements yeah. yesterday. Um, and, I, you know, he goes, well, you know, there's not going to be any, um, you know, I'm like, well, we're, we're at least two years away from whatever gun product is in production right. from happening, not realizing stuff might have already been in development. And uh, and Mitch said, well, you know, Star Wars hasn't done anything since Rise of Skywalker. And I'm like. <laughs> uh, Mandalorian, all these TV shows, and he goes, "Well, those are separate." I'm like, "Not no, anymore, they're buddy. No, they're not, not anymore. That's a 1999 problem. Well, that look, doesn't happen anymore." Well, this is this is the thing about, um, and and this happens to comics to a degree, but it's definitely happening with, it's definitely happened with music already, and it's happening with TV, where um, the context of release. Is uh, thanks, Kuma. <laughs> yeah, man. No, no. And yeah, the, the, the context of release is different. Okay, for example, um, you know, I can name. Uh, well, uh, we may have a general generational thing here. I don't know, but I, I, I could. Uh, what, what, what's, what's your, what's your favorite band from the '60s or '70s or '80s? Pick one. Uh, the Style Council from the '80s. Let's say that. Okay. Well, any given song, you would know what album it came off of, right? Music is not consumed on albums anymore. That is correct. You are right. And so, you know, you you would not necessarily know right away that, uh, you know, these two songs, which were a year apart, don't belong together necessarily in correct. the same part of the creator's canon, whereas the new listener has no idea. Um, the, the Knights of the Old Republic graphic novel uh, that we've got back here um, corrects the fact that we were late with issue nine and it ended up flip-flopping with issue 10 when it was released as a comic book, but we fixed it in the graphic novel. Gotcha. Sure. Nobody who wasn't there at the time will know that. Um, and with TV as well, I mean, how would you know if something had been theatrically released or not by watching the program? How would you know? How would you know that it had been a TV show or not? Um, you know, and and you know, things that things that and they've been doing for years, they've been making changes to things. Uh you know, it's to you know, the uh you know, Battlestar Galactica had one ending in the um in the cinematic release, the theatrical release, and it changed that ending for the TV release because they wanted to keep John Colicos around. And which is a great idea, but they changed it there. Um, I, you know, I, and I'm discovering stuff every day. I realized there's actually two clips of the end of uh, 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 two, two bumper, you know, bits at the end of the um, Mork and Mindy episode for where Robin Williams first appears on Happy Days. Yes. When it, when it originally appeared, there's a bumper at the end where. Robin shows up in the at the at the uh, after after Richie has realized it's all a dream. Right. Robin shows up as uh, you know, a character at the front door, just a right. regular guy. Oh God, but I remember took, that. But they took that off that ending. They took that ending off as soon as the Mork and Mindy show started, and they replaced it with a Mork calling Orson bit. Oh, that, on on the Happy Days rerun now. Yes. Wow. And so again. That's what they say. 
<laughs> but how would you know? If you were watching that now, you would assume that was always there. Right, right. And so this is why so I think yeah, you know, things like the Star Wars special edition versus the original Star Wars, these are kind of dear things that people know the the differences between these things sure. it's like, oh well that's you know obi-wan you know it's that's not the that's not the same you know that's that's not the same uh uh uh, uh that, that that's that's not the same crate dragon call it's it's a different sound now or or you know oh, darth <laughs> vader he didn't yell in the beginning and and you know what's this nonsense with the uh with the 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 praxis effect when the death star explodes i mean with yes <laughs> yeah good i like that you've Merge Star Trek and Star Wars with Praxis. Absolutely. Well, that's that's even, what they call it. Even uh, hey, oh, that's it. I didn't know that. That is, even, that is uh, what they call it. Even the end of Jedi, yeah, where it's Hayden Christensen now as the Force Ghost, rather than uh, the and, gentleman that originally played yeah. uh, adult uh, Anakin and everything. Yeah, and and the thing is, I I I, I think that this uh, another important thing about this has to do with uh, internet culture and and particularly social media when people will argue about a show when it's in production or in release before they know things. Yes. Um, I can go back to the old message. Well, I can't go anymore because they're gone. Right. But the old, <laughs> the, the, the old message boards for, for, for dark horse comics where people were arguing about issues of Knights of the old Republic as they were coming out and they didn't know what I was leading up to yet. Sure. And, so they would be arguing about this or that or the other thing. And it's like, of course, all those arguments are like they never happened by the time the trade we get up. to the completed work. Right, and, right. And <laughs> most of the things that people are complaining about, look at how many people complained about WandaVision for the first two episodes before they knew what it was about. And once they knew, it's like, oh. Sorry, well, okay. never mind. Yeah, we get never it. Mind. <laughs> but see, this moment... The argument moment is only right now. Of it course. won't be there again. Yes. Hopefully. You're killing me. God, John, honestly, <laughs> I love these observations. And I and I so agree with you. And that's why I threw up there that uh, what Joe said in terms of I can listen to John Price because <laughs> really this is great. And and uh, you know, I mean, are are we cool? I mean, I I we yeah, over fine. an hour. I mean, I, we we got more time because uh, yeah, we got some time. Okay, we, we haven't hit Comic Crime yet. Let's well, that's that. what I want. I do. I want to talk about Comic Crime. And John, please forgive my <laughs> assumption, but you are welcome back when you've got oh, something absolutely. new. No, but anything I, we don't need into this. this. All right, anything, anything we don't into this conversation, I certainly want to talk about more. That's good. Oh, that's yeah. right. So, so tell me about Comic Crime. Have you had a chance to crunch the twenty twenty two numbers? And you know, I mean, well, first yeah, of all, explain um, for the newbies that okay. might not know. What you Comicron, do. which originally was originally I called it the Comics Chronicles, but then uh, when uh, Tomorrow's did the American Comic Book Chronicles, I decided I would get out of the way. Uh, and also, I was already using Comicron, C O M I C H R O N. I was already using that as the um, uh, as the shorter version of the URL, anyway. Uh, and and basically, the 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 purpose of it had has has always been as an archives. An archive for every fact I have about uh, comic book circulation, the number of copies that exist. I act, we use the word sales a lot. I care more about circulation. I care about how much is out there. I care about the original supply because that's what people who are coming to my site um, looking at the older stuff care about. They don't care whether it was number one or not in 2009 or 1968 or 19-whatever. Uh, they want to know how many were around. They want to know, is this thing really rare? Is this thing not? Absolutely. Um, and the, the reason that I developed this site is because, um, well, I uh, I was a comics fan for years. I was a journalist uh, by trade. Uh, I I got the chance to come work with Don and Maggie Thompson at Comics Buyer's Guide. And you did. And I did, yeah. That's, uh, and yeah. Uh, and. And I was my job was editor of, as comics editor of comics retailer, which was the trade magazine of the business. Uh, I showed up just in time for the comics industry to collapse. Uh, this, <laughs> it was I, I didn't do it. Uh, it was, no, it's not your fault. <laughs> but that, that, but it was nineteen ninety three, and things sure. were starting to go down the tubes. And one of the reasons that they went down the tubes is because uh, there was incomplete information or no information that the collectors had about how much of this stuff that was coming out was really rare. 
and almost none of it was really rare. And that was a problem because a whole lot of people bet the farm. Sp the speculation market. Exactly. People, you know, yes. I got a number one. I'm going to put my kid through yeah. college because yes. I've got this number one. And there are now warehouses yeah. of those number ones. I have a, forgive me, a quick si aside. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I have a buddy who is in memorabilia, primarily sports. And a couple of years ago, he's like, you know, I got this great deal where I can get a bunch of 90s comics. Pennies no, 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 no. Exactly. And I'm like, they're not even worth pennies. I'm like, avoid, avoid. I'm, he's like, because uh, the guy's like, he's got a lot of number ones. I'm like, that's the problem. There no, are I, I, I've got 25 copies of X-Men number one from 1991. <laughs> I think I only bought one. I have, what happens every time I absorbed a collection from between now and then, it's there've been more. Um, sure. I bet you have but, a lot of Superman 75s, the death of Superman with Doomsday and everything. Yeah, well, it, it's, still in the uh, bag, still with all the tchotchkes. Oh, oh, exactly. There. And, you know, if we had an hour on just on this, I could get into <laughs> I, I could get into how, you know, how uh, gimmicks got weaponized and how these things come in from hobby to hobby. Because, uh, you know, Comics Buyer's Guide was published by Krause Publications, which also did records and sports cards and everything else. And... And literally things from those other hobbies came to us. The whole idea of slabbing, that comes from coins. Um, the, 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 you know, the idea of, uh, you know, these acetate covers and things like that, that comes from sports cards. And because there was cross-fertilization of the people that were involved with them and selling them, you know, that's how we get what we, what we got. Sure. Um, but again, you know, nobody knew what those numbers were. And then what happens is in uh, 95, Marvel... Uh, buys its own distributor and collapses the whole distribution market. And uh, as a result, we go for about a year and a half and nobody knows what the uh, best-selling comic is because there's no place to get all that information. Uh, I worked out a deal with Marvel where they provided me the data and I was able to merge it with the diamond numbers for my magazine. And then after Marvel went back to diamond, I just kept doing it. Uh, and... Um, over the years, uh, I continued to do it uh, even after I left the company. Uh, and as soon as I quit, I started Comicron.com to keep this stuff archived. Yes. And thank you, by the way, for doing you, that. Sure thing. And, I, and, and for 24 years, it was a regular um, thing in my life. I, I, I used to, it was getting to where it was like, a, a it, it was a serious burden after a while because I, once I can't I'm, imagine how much well, research and compiling the numbers. I can't imagine it, what, how much time it well, took. Well, the, the amount of data kept going up because when we started, it was uh, only a top 10 list for graphic novels. By night, uh, by 2017, it was a top 500 list. Um, wow. You know, wow. The, yeah, the top, the top 300 list in comics went to 500. Um, so I've got all that going on. And frequently, I'm at an airport because I'm going to go sign books someplace. Sure. And, and, you know, I have no control over when this stuff comes out, but I want to keep it updated because if I get behind, I'll be, I'll be behind forever. Oh my God. Um, and what happened is, uh, you know, while everything was unified under diamond, it was at least doable. Uh, and then the pandemic happens and, um, you know, DC uh, leaves the system, uh, leaves yes. diamond and when it does so, um, you know, the new company that the, the, the one of the two companies, surviving companies that it's with, um, you know, they they uh, they never have put out a single you know fact about their sales. And I have talked with them. I don't expect them to put anything out. Um, you know, they they you know, have their reasons, but it's also, you know, logistically, if you're doing your best to actually take over 5000 you know, accounts or however many it is. You know, that weren't carrying your stuff before, uh, you know, you got a lot better things to do than, you know, please, you know, the people that are you know, you know, wanting to just talk about you know, the horse race. Uh, okay. I've never been a horse race guy. I just want to, I just want to say what the health of the market is overall. Yes. Um, and, and, and so what happens is diamond is able to still continue putting out some information and they do. Um, but then in uh, October of 2021, uh, Marvel defects from uh, Diamond uh, and goes to Random House. Random House does not have a tradition of transparency when it comes to what they're selling. Because again, yes. 
they don't have the collectible dynamic that we have. Right. Um, what would be ideal for comics is if we had a situation, and we did have it for a long time, uh, in coin collecting, uh, in paper money collecting, um, it is a federal obligation to announce how many copies of a coin there are, how many copies of, of a bill there are. It is public knowledge, public information. Um, there is never any debate about how many things originally were struck. Um, the only debate is how many still exist in the right, you know, quality. Uh, how, how many, you know, how many survive in the right condition. Um, well, uh, in comics, we had more or less that for a long time. Yeah, John, that, what was that called? Because every at least yearly, DC and Marvel would have to uh, uh, disclose oh, that information. Well, no, that's a that's a different that's a different oh, thing. Let me, let, let sorry, me get to please. I'll get to that in a minute. That's a different data set entirely. Sorry, John, go on. I, I, what, what I'm saying though is okay. So so what happens is we can't do the Diamond data set anymore because Diamond also stopped doing stop releasing numbers in April of last year. Okay. So there's yeah. and, and Diamond was down to just image and uh, the other publishers and then a rump version of Marvel, what was left at uh, Diamond. And okay. for a while I was able to say, okay, yeah, I can I can compute Marvel based on what we think their share was, uh, but it eventually gets too hard to do. And um, I'm an archivist and not a, um, you know, I, I can analyze the figures that are out there. I'm not going to, I'm not a pollster. My, I'm not a survey person. I'm not going to go generate the content by interviewing every retailer in the country. Uh, that's not what I'm into this for. Uh, so more or less, I, uh, you know, the new material, I'm looking at that data set as temporarily complete on the forward end. It's not complete going back. Because even though I have almost all of the Capital City and Diamond and Heroes World charts in my files, the former they're, distributors not, they're not online yet. Okay. And so, okay. and so, and also I have not computed for everybody what those numbers mean. If you go back and look at my April 1993 page, you'll see the, the Diamond sales chart for that month. Uh, because I, uh, that's one of the ones I did put up. And I have a, a, a guesstimate at what those numbers you know reflect okay. um but but i haven't done the heavy lifting work on those um to the degree because i've got other data sets so yes even though uh, okay so the 2022 you're asking about will there be a report on 2022 i don't know how much i'm going to be able to do sure. uh, because because that that data set is closed on the other hand i have spent more time on Comicron related work in the last three or four months that I have in years. And that is because I have other data sets, uh, as I mentioned. Um, one of the data sets is what you were just mentioning. Uh, that is the, the, uh, the postal data set. Uh, the United States Postal Service required every comic book that was sold by second class mail, uh, and which was later called periodical class. Uh, starting with 19, is, uh, the, the forms had to run in magazines going all the way back to 1874, but it was only in 1960 that they began running the circulation numbers. And then later it became not just how many copies you printed, but how many copies went to subscribers, how many copies were destroyed, how many copies went for somebody for free. Um, and the reason that they did that was in order to protect the consumer uh, so to so as to make sure that um, uh, Sears wasn't pretending that the Sears catalog was a magazine. Interesting. Uh, so that junk mailers were not sending things to people who were not requesting them um, and using the second class rate. I understand. And wow. so, yeah, and so that's, that's what it was for. And so what happens is that's a data set, which is pretty interesting. And, uh, and uh, it, it, just about everybody uh, in comics had their comics going through that system. DC uh, stopped sending comics by second class in 1988. Okay. Uh, they start sending them first class, and okay. so they no longer have to do it. Uh, Marvel stops handling subscriptions entirely on its own uh, in after 2011. Uh, they all now come from Midtown Comics, and so they're not coming at the wow. second class rate. Yeah. And so they're not in it. Archie, likewise, 2016. That's the end of their numbers. 
the only one of these um, uh, outfits or publishers that is still running the statement of ownership is Mad Magazine. Crazy. And, yeah. Wow. Well, no, not crazy. Mad. No, I'm with <laughs> John, this is great. You get that this joke. Is, but I love joke. this is the kind of inside baseball yeah. that when it happens, well, I'm thrilled. Continue. Well, I, I, I have, uh, it's taken me 25 years, but I have basically all of those forms. Wow. And, and I, I will say that I am working on getting that material out there. And it isn't is, it interesting how the market has changed? I'm sorry, please. Because you, well, well and, and because I now have the time to do that. Okay. I okay. can I can get that. There is another major source uh, of data um, that I've got, which is uh, the audit data. Um, the Audit Bureau of Circulation. If you see in the, the indicia of a magazine where it says, this magazine was audited by the Audit Bureau of Circulation or the BPA or something like that. Okay. What that means is uh, that's that's an outfit. That's an actual third-party company that says that the number of copies that you tell advertisers that you are selling is the real number of copies. And they've been around for a hundred years. And so some of the earliest data that we have, even before the postal data, because postal starts in, in 1960. Well, I've got numbers on uh, more fun comics. Wow. I've got, I've got numbers. On, oh yeah. I've got numbers on stuff from the 1930s. Sure. Um, and, and again, that's not the easiest stuff to work with because they bundle things. Okay. Uh, but I'm able to actually tease out what's in each month because wow. I went down to their offices in Chicago and I photographed most of their microfilm. Oh, uh, that's great. Oh, I'm glad you did that. That's fantastic. So, man. so that's, so that's another thing. And I have to get around to finishing my work with it. Wow. But there are other sources. Um, I've got a lot of primary material. Um, I have stuff that has been leaked. Um, from Marvel, from other publishers, actual data, sometimes on floppy disks. I, I got, I, I actually, I, I, I was really happy this week. I got some of that leaked uh, uh, physical uh, you know, printouts that corresponded to uh, a floppy disk uh, graphics that I could no longer crack. And I realized, okay, this is exactly what this is. This is, this is, this is uh, this is uh, you know this is this is the printout of this file that I can't open. Um, do, you and, have, and, do you have older computers? Oh yeah, so that you can obviously. Oh yeah, but yeah, and and and, and 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 but that's because I'm nuts, uh, and also because. <laughs> but also, also, I'm a Macintosh guy, so everything I ever had still works. Oh, that's uh, great. Sure, and, sure. Uh, I, all my old Apple computers still work. Uh, my son is you know tried to dismantle it and put it back together five times, but it still that's works. Great. Oh my um, God. So that's another thing. So I have that, I have that, you know, I, I when when Capital City Distribution went under, um, I drove down with Maggie Thompson and we brought back all the all the uh, sales data. All the data. Wow. Uh, not all of it, but we brought back you know a lot of it. And most of that made its appearance in a, a series of books I did called the Standard Catalog of Comic Books. Um, but that's a series of books that's out of print and I need to get that back in print again. So yeah. There's, there's, there's all these other things that, you know, it's, it's weird. That that's sort of been my, my hobby moonlighting thing. Comicron has been, um, but I haven't been able to put the time into it because I had to care about, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the new stuff. Well, sure. I had, to, I had, and I'm still doing the new stuff on the website yesterday, every Wednesday, because I'm in archives Diamond still puts out its uh, its reorder list, which says you know what sold so well that they you know had to reorder copies, but that's not really a a, a very heavy demand um, compared to you know the numbers would come in uh, you know back in the day when the numbers would come in by fax machine you know I could usually get you know I I could get something into print or or on onto our onto our website forum in about three hours. Um, it got to where it was taken two or three days. And uh, yeah, I, I, I now have those days back. And I also am not really having to concern myself too much about the fan on fan violence uh, that takes place over whether, whether a book is doing well or not. And I find it absolutely ridiculous that anybody would, you know, argue about that. I know people used to, 
I remember people having a preference between Marvel or DC or whatever. The horse race. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I remember, yeah, certainly I remember, yeah, fanographics and the, and the, you know, comics for art crowd, not liking the comics for money and superheroes crowd, the the commercial side of things. We had those kind of schisms, but we didn't have anything that anybody could start a YouTube channel about or anything that anybody could, could argue about on Twitter or whatever. It was, it was, uh, we, to a, in a sense, we didn't, well, we didn't have as many pages to fill. We didn't have as many hours to fill. We didn't have as many minutes to fill. Um, uh, although, you know, the, the flame wars in the, in the, you know, the comics buyer's guide pages, they would get pretty bad in the letters pages, but you know, they would, they would, pro- <laughs> They would progress about a week at a time, you know, a handful of letters. Sure. So, so anyway, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I can't say that I'm disappointed to not have to really, you know, be aware of everything that's going on in the world like that. John, honestly, again, I'm saying this for thousands, if not more uh, fans. Thank you for doing the hard work because honestly, nothing, dr- the one bugaboo that I have yeah. is when information is out there yeah. and there are a lot of for a lack of a better word irresponsible youtubers and podcasters podcasters who are very definite in their opinions of oh no things went this way yeah. and it's like you did no research and you don't know well, what you're talking about and i'm glad that there is hard data but even further now yeah. it is so hard and it's funny because the same thing as you well know is happening in television, uh, where the streamers yeah. don't disclose their numbers, right? I am a I am a local, or I was yeah. for thirty years a Chicago broadcaster in radio and a little bit in TV, right? And um, I know very well um, our our main radio and television critic Robert Feeder would yeah. get access to uh, the Arbitron and okay. Nielsen ratings, and all of a sudden Nielsen, which is now they bought Arbitron, yeah. they pulled back. And if you don't buy yeah. the numbers to use to get advertisers, you don't get access. And they are policing that very hard. These well, and days. that's that's Nielsen and BookScan with graphic novels, and you know the, the that you know Brian Hibbs has been able to write his piece every year for for Heidi site. Yes. Uh, you know, for as long as as long as he's been, uh, it's been wonderful. Yes. Uh, but again, you know, it, there's a lot of interest in obscuring the data. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I, I, I want to be the institutional memory to a degree because that's what, um, you know, my, you know, my, uh, yeah, I, I, my mentors, uh, Don and Maggie, uh, you, you know, stood as and, uh, and still are, uh, or Maggie, yeah. Maggie is. Absolutely. Uh, Maggie's great. Absolutely. And, yeah. and the, the intention is, uh, I think we've lost so much, uh, by the magazines being gone. Um, and because the magazines plus Overstreet were really the place that educated people about the history um, in one place uh, and, and, and standards for the business, uh, standards for the hobby, uh, you know, yeah. things like, you know, what really constitutes a first appearance, uh, what constitutes a cameo. Um, you know, one of the things that happened in uh, in the pandemic is uh, people started bidding up magazines or or, or uh, catalogs with ads that had the first appearance of Spawn in them or whatever. And and the thing is, well, there aren't many of those things around. Well, there aren't many of those things around because we all commonly understood back in the day that those were not the first appearance of these things in anything that mattered. Uh, that that was the equivalent of you know having a Porsche brochure and thinking you own a car. Right. Or um, even a, a, a TV guide ad for an upcoming. Or yeah. A, I mean, know, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. Stuff. Yeah. I, you know, I love posting yes. the TV guys, but the fact that, you know, the, okay, I can kind of see the first, you know, the, the 1966 fall preview issue of, of, of TV guide. Yeah. I can kind of see that being worth more. Yeah, sure. Uh, it, because of the Star Trek is in it. Sure. Cool. But, um, <laughs> but, but that's, that's yeah. I think that's uh yeah. I think I think it's not worth a million dollars. Right, and uh, it's a different animal. It's a different and, animal. And and you know we're talking about people you, you know who who you know, they just honestly don't know what the standards were. Um, you know 
you know, mint condition, very near mint, very fine, uh, you know, fine, very good, good, fair, uh, poor, coverless. Uh, we ingrained that in people over the course of decades. Yes. Uh, uh, we ingrained all sorts of things. And uh, where do you get that? And I will say, uh, my friend Nick, who does the um, uh, the uh, the key collector app, uh, he's to a degree doing this. I mean, he is he's he's, he's 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 really more or less uh, you know taken. Uh, you know, he's, his app has more or less taken the section of Overstreet, which said what the first appearances of, of everything were, and it's kind of you know, monetized that. It's kind of said, okay, here's 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 the first this, here's the first that, here's the first this, here's the first that. And, and there is sort of an education there, but it's very piecemeal in the sense that, you know, you don't really have somebody doing a page on 1968 where, you know, I'm able to say, all right, here are all the threads. Here's all the stuff that's going on. Uh, and, and, you know, here I'm going to boil it down and here are the five big points about this year. Um, Archie is booming. Uh, Batman is about to get canceled, uh, the TV show. Uh, yes. You know, all of these things, um, uh, you know, um, that are going on. Uh, and and so I'm, I'm looking to do more of that kind of thing in the future uh, and less of, less of the monthly grind. I understand, yeah, outside elements and how they're impacting. Oh, yeah. Uh, I get it. Seriously, John, that's fantastic. And it's... God, I've, I mean, really, I, I, I never knew how to get a hold of you. I'm so glad we're having this conversation <laughs> because I've been, I've been thinking about this. I'm not even, I'm not even a serious uh, collector. Yeah. You know, I, I'm happy to buy reader copies. When uh, Superman yeah. and Lois started, I wanted that imaginary tale yeah. of Superman's sons, yeah. and I first read it in an 80 page giant and was oh, yeah. to discover because I'm not granular like other collectors are that it was in a 12 cent comic first. And, you know, yeah. I bought a ten dollar reader copy. If yeah. it's worth fifty dollars more than the ten dollars I spent, great. I noticed. Oh God, what? Oh, um, yesterday I talked to Tom King. And oh they yeah. Announced, you know, James Gunn announced that they're adapting uh, his Supergirl uh, series that he did with Bill Quis um uh, as as a you know, upcoming DC movie. And I looked on eBay and just to grab, yeah, just to grab a couple, yeah. you know. Uh, cover images as I've done with our talk. Yeah. And it's so funny. It's like out of stock, out of stock. And it's no, like, yeah, I, I, and I'm, I'm sure, stuff. I'm sure the key collector app did a special update just for, I'm just sure. for, but and, and that's say, okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Would you say, and I, and I, and I'm just curious for your own personal opinion, yeah. because um, would you say that their speculation of value is, is accurate? Because, um, Okay. What drove me nuts during the wizard years was yeah. they had that section in the back that kind of modeled itself from Overstreet, but right. they were so. F and I'm I, everybody listening. This is John Suntra saying this, not John Jackson Miller. Yeah, they were so full of shit, and and their <laughs> um, and their inflation of value not only to comics in general but their own Black Bull imprint was so full of shit. Well, the, uh, the 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 thing with Wizard and it, Wizard was our um, our uh, di distinguished competition. At All right, fair enough. Um, you know, I, 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 I should I should say that that you know um, it was right before my time, but uh, my publisher was brought into a meeting where uh, he, he, he was he was told, "Tell us what we can do to make our own Wizard." And what he did is he went out and he priced a copy of the magazine, what it cost to actually produce it. And he came back and he told them what it would cost for our company to actually produce our own version of, of Wizard. And they laughed him out of the room. They said, oh, my God, because it was, it, you know, there was it, it, it's it's a it, it was just a, a different model than we were doing. We were doing sure. these, you know, these classified ad you know, driven, uh, you know, and, 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 and advertising driven magazines where we got one page of editorial for every three pages of ads. Um, and you could, you couldn't do that with, with, with wizard because that wasn't what it was. It was a, sure. it was a lifestyle magazine as it much as it was. It was people magazine to yeah. your time yeah. or U S news and world. Report. So, uh, you know, but, but, you know, the dynamic in the price guide section, because we, we, um, you know, I, I, we, had our own price guide uh, and 
yeah, the, the thing with the thing with Wizard is they were very interested in leading the market uh, and being the first people to claim that something was more valuable than something else. Because when they were right, uh, that gave them credibility. Uh, and for a time, and th the only time it really got uh, you know, a little, eh, we weren't real happy with it, was they had a magazine called Entertainment Retailing, which was a big tabloid competitor to my comics retailer magazine. Okay. Uh, and uh, one of their features was uh, they would show the retailers what the future wizard prices were going to be. These are going to be the prices that we're going to be putting in the magazine a month from now. So you can go ahead and mark your comics up to match them. And that was literally in the copy. And okay, I was like, all right, that's that's not our job. Yeah, that's market manipulation. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that that I and 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 that magazine, you know, it didn't last. And um, you know, I was I was I was not thrilled with that. And and yeah, uh you, church and state kind of things. I, I did Scry yes. Mag I, I did Scry magazine uh, for the card game market. Uh, okay. for a for a time for a time Wizards of the Coast had its own magazine called Top Deck, which had its own price guide. Okay. And it's like, oh that's a little uh you, you don't that that gets really iffy, you know, when you're putting things out in these randomized packs claiming that they have no cash value and you have a magazine that says they have a cash value. Uh, that gets you in danger with lottery rules and and yes. sweepstakes rules and all sorts of yes. other things. If anyone's um, paying attention, but yeah. So so yeah, I mean, uh, so that was that was going on. I will say though, with regard to speculation, first of all, I do not believe the speculation caused the crash of the of the of the early nineties. Um, it was uh, it was uh, it was a market. Uh, it was a it was basically like a real estate market bubble, except it was credit. It was the fact that we had twelve distributors. And they were willing to open up stores across the street from one another without any regard or much regard to whether they were a real going concern. Um, this was a time where we had uh, 11,000 accounts buying comics at one point. Wow, uh, 11,000 11, distinct accounts, yes. of which the number of actual storefronts, depending on who you ask, we thought it was around 7,000, uh, which obviously let in all of these um, weekend warriors guys that only had an account so that they could sell on uh, in the, in the flea markets on the weekend. Sure. Um, sure. You know, there was a, there was a comic shop in Memphis that was uh, in a, a psychiatrist's office where there was just a cash box in the front door and uh, at the front door and all the comics were in the back. I'm told there's another such place like that now there, uh, wow. it's, but it's uh, it's more of a showroomy kind of a thing. But, but again, all these things that were just not really, you know, um, um, you know, the, 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 the number one thing affecting the number of uh, copies in circulation is the number of stores there are ordering them, the number of accounts there are ordering them. And so back then there was, there were no controls on that sort of thing. And, you know, when you did have finally a collapse, it starts taking out retailers who take out distributors, who take out publishers. Um, and the other element, as I had said earlier, is these comics are not really rare. Uh, right. And, you know, back in the day, you could, if you were doing a variant cover, the variant cover might be for half the run. You know, it might be for a third of the run or a fifth of the run, but it wouldn't be for something really rare, like a hundred copies. Uh, that was infrequent. Um, these days, I think it's more manageable because by having these, uh, the ability that they've got now at the printers to do these micro print runs of one or five or a hundred copies and things for the retailers, the odds are these special editions for retailers the odds of a comic book being able to hold its value because it is rare, uh, the odds are higher uh, because it's not the case that there are 8 million copies of X-Men number volume two, number one around. It's not the case that there's a warehouse fine that's going to happen. That's going to dump all these copies on the market. Um, you know, these things really are rare and, the, the the number of them usually is you know, somewhat controlled by the market because the retailers know how many customers they've got that will pay for the $100 book. 
And so they're not gonna they're not going to buy too many of the books to get that if they know that won't pay off for, in the end. Understood. So a, a long story short, I have not been as worried about the latter wave of variants. I do, uh, co- I am concerned about what it does to the retailers uh, because the number of variants last year went up a lot. And when you're starting to deal with, I think three, uh, you know, three other lines on the order form for every comic book on average, there's an additional three lines on the order form. Uh, how do you manage that? That's, that's expensive. That's that. How do you handle it? Um, so again, these are very long answers to a number of questions, but I think yeah, that's this is great. This is great. That's, that's kind of where I am with that. I, I think that, you know, the, when I, but as far as, you know, 2022 and 23 and 24, I've never been in the fortune telling business. I do say that comics as an art form are, and as a medium are in better shape than they were uh, in, in years. And obviously the numbers show that I do think that, I do think that the comic book, uh, the periodical has a reason to exist. Uh, and as long as there are collectors, there will be people buying them uh, and people buying them. There'll be people creating them. Whether the market will look the same after five years with, um, you know, diamond and random house and lunar uh, and- lunar. And yeah, that's hard to say. I, I, I think I, I just know that my part of the world doesn't look the same. I hear you, man. No. And again, uh, I'm glad you did the work that you did. And I appreciate that you're, you know, stay, pay, paying attention as best you can. No, man, there's two. And, and then beyond the periodical, all the different platforms that are out there. I uh, thank my uh, Star Wars and Star Trek fans for hanging on through this if they did. Hey, no, no, no. And that's <laughs> this fine. Is, and this, is the, this is the whole, the, the, the whole comics thing is a whole nother thing. So. We, we, spent, we spent a healthy hour. I'm happy to go back to that. You, Sab. No, we're good. Has, we're good. That you're well, you, just, you know, I want to acknowledge that he said this. Yeah, that your Knights good. of the Old Republic run is one of his favorite comic runs oh, ever. But no, I, I really wanted to get into this as well, John. Okay. So that's great. So you mentioned the the, the cons that you're going to, yeah. Uh, and I and I would ask you to to do it again because I'm likely for the audio audience to uh, uh, break this up in. Yeah. Okay, here's us talking about Star Wars and Star Trek. Oh, very good. Here's, here's us talking yeah. about comic books. Yeah, uh, the, I love uh, what we've been talking about. Please continue. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Strange New Worlds uh, release event is at uh, Barnes and Noble in uh, uh, in the West Town location in Madison. That is the 21st of uh, February. That's that's the release day. So definitely, uh, the audiobook, ebook, and uh, hardcover come out the same day. So go pre-order that because that locks your orders in and it tells the retailers to stock more because uh, that's the only way they know. Uh, so, so definitely that, uh, that weekend, that Friday and Saturday, I am at, uh, Great Lakes Comic-Con in Detroit. Uh, the following weekend, uh, which is the first weekend of March, I'm at Emerald City Comic-Con and, uh, I'm doing at least three panels there and, uh, I, I will have a table. Uh, I am at Richmond, uh, GalaxyCon Richmond. I think this is the third weekend or fourth weekend in March. Uh, C2E2, we've sort of, sort of talked about uh but then i and then later in the summer we've already i think we've already announced that i'm doing a uh, raleigh uh that is galaxy con raleigh uh and um you know i've got some other things lined up which i uh, haven't haven't announced yet people can always uh find me uh on uh, my website farawaypress.com uh i actually just this last fall um started a an ebay store um oh great and- john yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a I you know I'd been selling off some of my collectibles there, some of my you know some of my back issue, not really back issue, but some of my my role playing game stuff that I'd gotten over the years. Uh, but uh, I I realized you know I I have so much trouble with these online bookstores that they have for authors, and I saw that one of the other authors uh, had an, an eBay store where you know he's you've got a signed copy of the book, put it on eBay uh, and just at a standard price and, uh, and uh, you know, offer to, uh, to, you know, to sign them all, but offer to uh, offer to, uh, you know, personalize them. Uh, and I did that uh, for the Christmas holiday and that went really well. So Great. I got a, bu- I got a bunch of stuff up there right now. Uh, the, the store is far away press um, and uh, is the name under it. Uh, then of course, uh, uh, social media, people can find me at, uh, at, uh, on Twitter, JJM far away. Uh, that is also my, uh, my handle on post.news. Uh, then we've got, uh, Facebook. I'm John Jackson Miller, Instagram, John Jackson Miller. 
people who are interested in the Comicron side of things, I have Comicron, C-O-M-I-C-H-R-O-N, uh, on Twitter. Uh, there's a page for that on Facebook. There's a page for that on, on Post.News. And I also have a Patreon for it. Uh, and people who are really into the behind the scenes of what I'm up to over there uh, can go uh, and check it out there. That's outstanding, John. Honestly, um, I really appreciate the time. I You know you're welcome back. Because you. There is so much more to talk about. Um, before we do go real fast, um, sure. you're, uh, you know, uh, how, are you, and again, you're working with them. Are you enjoying new Star Trek? Are you, oh, are yeah. you because you, uh, you really, I, and I said this to, to Mike Friedman as well. And I, and I feel this way about all the really good, uh, people that do, uh, novel ad adaptations. You guys walk between the raindrops, that great Donald Fagan title, <laughs> his, uh, his old songs, but you do, man. I mean, it's, uh, that's tough. But you, you, as you say, you tell a great story. You leave the you, you when it's done. The toys are all back where they belong on the shelf, and yeah. that's a tough. That's a tough trick to do. And I think you do a great job. Is it uh, because again you've been doing it for so long, and you were doing it prior yeah. to the new Trek regime? Are they easy to work with? Are you? Are you? Oh, yeah. again, you mentioned Kristen Beyer. I'm glad to hear that she seems to be so uh, yeah. great to work with and appreciates what you do. I love that. Uh, although I'm a little disappointed that they didn't acknowledge it in strange new worlds. They obviously took um, Una's backstory. Number one story from a lot of one of DC Fontana's Trek novels, it seemed. And I, I, I wish there was more credit at least given uh, from where they're getting their material from. Uh, well, I, Una's name I, came I, from I, Una's name came from the novels. Uh, yeah, I think I think uh, David Mack named her, uh, but I think the, I think the idea was uh, Greg Cox's. Uh, okay. uh, but uh, but now the uh, the yes yeah some of the some of the Illyrian stuff exactly where back in the history that came from and how how that developed. Um, you know the thing is it, it's uh, I I I'm. This is a, this is an evolving thing, and um, you know I I as I mentioned um, you know I in in two thousand eight uh, I saw that uh, I, I'm in the theater watching Iron Man. And I see that Christine Everhart, the reporter that is in my one of my Iron Man stories, sure. is the reporter on screen, and that's awesome. Well, let's go ten years later. Ant Man the Wasp is out. And uh, and Sonny Birch, the villain uh, that is played by um, uh, Walton Goggins, uh, well, he's also from that same run of Iron Man comics. But now my wife and I are in the theater uh, at the premiere, and so is Jorge Lucas, uh, no relation to George Lucas, uh, who they flew up from Argentina, uh, and and you know, we're now watching the end of the movie. So uh, that's in ten years. And these things evolve. Um, okay. You know, Siegel and Schuster, you know, had to fight and scrap and fight to get ten thousand dollars a year. Yep. And that was in the seventies. Yeah, that's and right. So, uh, or whatever the number was. And so, uh, these things, things, uh, things are evolving. Things are changing. The more people, uh, you know, are 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 you know, going into positions of authority who read our stuff read comics, read whatever it is, the more they're likely to be sensitive to those issues. That's great to hear. And clearly I do see that that's happening. And yes, and I meant to make that point as well. Guys like Favreau and Filoni, Filoni in the yeah. Star Wars world clearly grew up just like we did, loving this stuff, loving the novels, loving the animation or whatever was out there in the wilderness years, and they do want to acknowledge that. I, uh, I, oh, you know, Usab wants to know, and I didn't realize. So you've got a pirate comic coming out? Oh yeah, yeah. It's uh, w whenever it comes out. Uh, this, yeah, I, uh, I mentioned I did some video game comics work, uh, and uh, so yeah, I, I have a book that uh, my friend James Mishler, who was the the guy that helped me design uh, the maps that are in uh, in the Strange New Worlds book. Uh, he and I uh, worked together on a, uh, a series called uh, Skull and Bones, uh, The Savage Storm. Uh, Skull and Bones is a video game from Ubisoft, uh, and it is a pirate video game, and it has all the elements that you would expect to be in, in, in that. And uh, this, thing, this thing has been drawn, and it's beautiful, uh, and it's ready, 
uh, and, and it has been postponed now twice because the game is not available yet. Okay. And so uh, there's no sense in putting the book out before, before the, the video game. game. Sure. I've been there before. I before the cartoon was out in case of rebels and, and you know there's there's a you know it, it it it's it is interesting historically to know that the Star Wars novel came out six months before the movie or five months before the movie. It's interesting to know that the Star Wars comics launched before the movie, uh, and it was probably helpful in a way. Um, but you know if you want the big bang that happens when the actual product is there. Uh, oh yeah, recognize what it is. People were asking Tom King yesterday, will there be a sequel? to his uh S supergirl thing with uh with miss evely and i'm like well you know when the movie comes out they're gonna put out another arc of That'd course they are. so john seriously this was so great well, I, I appreciate it john and i'm gonna go back and watch some of your old episodes I, I mean, oh that's I'm, nice man I no no it. definitely that, like i said I'm, i know i saw the jamie farr thing uh because oh, that's I, great. I, <laughs> yeah, I because uh, I I remember that him talking about his his comics collecting days. So it was it was such an honor, and I was I mean really like I mean you know I, you know now cameo prices have inflated a bit. This is when it was still a novelty, and it's so funny. My co-hosts are like, we got to do another, and I'm like, who else is gonna give us the kind <laughs> of stuff that Jamie Farr did? He was so <laughs> gracious about uh, it. Yeah, you'd be surprised. I mean, I I what, that is one of the things that I do is I I. When I go to these conventions, I go and, and you know, I, 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 you know, it, it you know, both, both poor, uh, you know, Cindy Williams and Lisa Loring in this past week, I, yeah. I talked to both of them oh, uh, and, wow. and, and Cindy just fairly recently uh, at a con and, um, and actually Cindy did, uh, Cindy did the Iola car show, uh, which is up here where, where Krause Publications, the building still is, uh, it, it's now owned by the car show. But she she did the car show. Henry Winkler uh, did that as well. And isn't, I, I met he, him. isn't he great? I met him there. Oh yeah, what well, a Henry. what a match. The no, font no, and he no, did no. not be sweeter. No, oh, Henry no. Henry wrote in for the fiftieth. Uh, not fifth. We did a seventy fifth birthday issue uh, for Stan Lee uh, of the Comics Buyer's Guide, and Henry wrote for, wrote in for that. Uh, wrote my birthday message. So, so that was terrific. Um, and and uh, but but yeah, uh, it, it is it is. Um, it's the thing when I, when I, when I visit with these folks, I mean, you know, this is another market that didn't really exist before the, 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 the place for uh, these folks who have not been on screen in a long time uh, necessarily to, uh, to meet the fans and by merging it with the other, you know, collectible pop culture thing that we've got, um, you know, that, that gets them in the middle of this stuff. Uh, that we do this thing we do this uh, our, our our own our own whatever you want to call it and uh, and uh, you know uh, they'll talk I mean I I got I got I got Henry to sign uh, my Happy Days number one uh, you know from uh, from Gold Key uh, that's not great a, wow not a, not a good comic book at all but it's got his signature not. on it and that's all that matters the um, I met uh, last year at C two E two. And I know you'll know this name, Barry Gordon, the great character actor. Yeah. Oh, who, Barry. Oh, God. I've got. Oh, got a photo with him. That's. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. See, and that's what I did, and I'm like, and it was great because all these kids, because he was the voice of one of the, you know, if not two of turtles. Them. Uh, uh, yeah. I when I when I met Barry Gordon, and this is again at, at a, an anime show that I'm doing signing for, so it's not really my thing, and I don't know if it's really his thing necessarily. Sure. But I, I I walk up and I say, you know, I don't know whether to ask you about fish or Super Train, in which you were the last person. On Super Super Train. Train. He, was the, he was the last guest on Super Train, and I, I finally narrowed it down to asking him about uh, Archie Bunker's place, sure, and and uh, and 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 the twenty five thousand dollar pyramid, which oh, I, I asked, <laughs> uh, which I asked just about everybody about because I'm obsessed with it. So, oh um, God, thank God for Buzzer. I'm so with you and those those old games. See, Tattletales is my old game oh, show that yeah, I the, the, the banana section. That's, exactly, uh, exactly, and uh, Barry. Yeah, and you know what's great? I never knew up until maybe 10 years ago that uh, Barry did that movie, black and white movie with Jason Robards, A Thousand mm -hmm. Clowns, that serious drama. When he was right. a kid, he was like 12 years old or whatever. Oh, wow. And I don't know who was next to him on Autograph Row, but I'm like, Barry, I just discovered A Thousand Clowns. And I hear this guy go, see, Barry, A Thousand Clowns. People remember. <laughs> and, you know, Barry's in his 80s now or whatever he is. And I talked to him about Fish and Archie Bunker and all those great show Barney Miller, him showing up a couple times on Barney Miller. I love it. And it was so great. Cause like I said, all these kids are there for the turtle. Yeah. And I'm like, Barry, I got to hear more about 
you're on screen stuff. And he could not have been sweeter. And I, of course, took a picture. Yeah, I, I, I just, yeah. you know, it's, it takes me back to the old conventions and that I used to do as a kid where, you know, there would be one actor, John Agar or somebody. Uh, and, yeah. and <laughs> John Agar, fantastic. Yeah, and, and, absolutely. And, 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 you know, and, uh, or Kirk Allen or somebody like Certainly that. Certainly Kirk Allen, Buster Crab, I met back in the day, Clayton Moore, I met back in the day. And they would often be just the only guest, media guest at a show uh, because it wasn't a thing, it wasn't a no. business. It wasn't, you know, there wasn't an uh, infrastructure for it. Right. So anyway, all right. Well, John, I've enjoyed the hell out of this. this is I'm really good. glad, John. Good. Because again, I don't want to, I I don't mean to take up too much. I, I, yeah. I, I, I think if all, if all my podcasts end up going like this, I won't have a voice <laughs> left over well, to announce yeah, this I'm, book. I, I got an iron butt and I got a, I got an <laughs> iron throat from four hours of radio five days a week. So I can, uh, I understand. All right. But yeah, come back, man. We'll talk more. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you, John Jackson Miller, everybody. I'm uh, talking to, uh, as I said, Franco and Mitch, and we're going to do a, a week review of all the great uh, sci-fi that we've been getting lately. Uh, that'll be tomorrow night, Friday. So hopefully join us then. Until next time, stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy. <laughs>